Okay, everybody, it's um, two minutes past ten in the Netherlands. It's two minutes past four in Taiwan. So let's start with uh, the webinar. Uh, welcome to this uh, cybersecurity webinar about security business opportunities in the Netherlands. Uh, this uh, webinar is organized by ITRI, the Netherlands Office Taipei, the Hague Security Delta, uh, the Netherlands uh, Enterprise Agency, and, and many more partners. And we are very happy to welcome uh, over 70 attendees to this uh, webinar. So first of all, I'll go through some housekeeping before I'll introduce myself and the program. Uh, as you've all noted, you are muted at the moment. Uh, if needed, the host can unmute you during the webinar, uh, for example, during the Q&A session. Um, due to uh, privacy reasons, you can only view the name of the host. So myself, the presenters and the panelists. Um, so you can only see their names and, uh, and the video. There's, of course, room for uh, questions during the seminar, during the webinar. Uh, you can do this uh, via the chat function in WebEx. Um, you can comment on the presentations and ask your questions there. Then I will come back to your question at the Q&A session. And also at the end of the session, there's room for live questions as well. And please note that this, that this, Q, that this uh, webinar will be recorded. So um, let's start with introducing myself. Uh, my name is Chris van Voorden, and I'm the Director of Internationalization and Foreign Investments at the Innovation Quarter. Innovation Quarter is the regional economic development agency for the Greater Rotterdam the Hague area, uh, one of the main regions in the Netherlands. Um, and one of our functions is, uh, one of our tasks is to uh, support foreign companies to set up businesses in our region and in the Netherlands, and also to help uh, companies from our region to scale up internationally. Um, I have some experience with uh, Taiwan as well. I visited Taiwan once. I uh, was there last year, almost exactly a year ago, in May 2019, as part of the trade mission on cybersecurity to Taiwan. And um, I had the honor to be delegation leader of um, this business um, of this business mission. Uh, this mission was uh, joined by uh, companies and knowledge institutes from our region and from the Netherlands. Uh, and what I really noted there is that there's lots of potential of working together on the cybersecurity challenges and opportunities in both markets. And therefore, I'm also pleased to hear that um, the president of Taiwan, President Tsai, finds this sector so important as well. Because in her second inauguration speech last May, she mentioned cybersecurity as one of the core strategic industries of Taiwan, which will be, will be further developed and integrated with 5G, digital transformation, and, natural sec and, uh, and national security. Um, the goal is to create a cybersecurity system and industrial supply chain to uh, strengthen national and business security online, which I'm very happy to hear and which really relates well with the topic of today uh, and with the opportunities we see in bo both markets. I also joined the session yesterday. That session was uh, meant for Dutch companies with an interest in the Taiwanese market. Also there, there were lots of participants and um, a good program and interest from, uh, uh, from the companies joining. So it's, it's really nice to see in those two days that there is uh, an eye for opportunities that goes both ways. Opportunities for Dutch companies in Taiwan in the field of cybersecurity and vice versa of Taiwanese companies in the Netherlands. So having said that, let's go to the program of today because we have lined up some interesting speakers for you. First of all, I have the honor to introduce Martijn van Hogehuizen who is Senior Account Manager Cybersecurity in my team in Innovation Quarter. And he will present you the um, opportunities and the um, landscape of the cybersecurity market in the Netherlands. Uh, after Martijn, we will have uh, Rick Schiffler from the Hague Security Delta, who is the innovation liaison there. And he will present more about um, the ecosystem that HSD represents 
and access to uh, several important points from HSD, like access to market, access to innovation, talent, and knowledge, and also to capital. And after the presentation of Rick, we will have time for the Q&A session. Like I said, we will cover the questions that will be typed in the chat function, but we will also have room for live questions during that part of the webinar. Now I would like to uh, ask uh, Martijn to take over and to start his presentation about the business opportunities in the Netherlands in the field of cybersecurity. Martijn. Thank you very much, Chris. Let me start with the title page. I named it Getting to Know the Netherlands. Uh, it's a bit more about the Netherlands, uh, maybe than about the actual cybersecurity policies of the Netherlands. I will go into that in a little bit. But I am trying to give an overview of the cybersecurity market um, as good as I can. Netherlands, it's a tiny country. Uh, it's here where the orange arrow is. It's a bit far away from Taiwan, but you might know it as you are in this webinar, and we do have quite some history. We are a uh, market within Europe. We are in the midst of three neutral countries. We are neutral between three countries, Germany, France, United Kingdom. We have an international outlook and openness, uh, which is firmly ingrained into the Dutch culture. Last night I was reading a book about the Dutch history, and uh, it always fascinates me how um, our history was with the seafaring, et cetera, et cetera. We do pretty well when it comes to uh, supportive conditions to economic growth. We are quite stable as an economy. Our inflation is low. The long-term interest rates are also low and uh, our government deficit and the state debt are pretty good at this point, even though we have taken out some money to fight the COVID-19 crisis as any other economy. Netherlands, you might know it of its flowers, its tulips. You might know it of its windmills, which we use to keep our polders dry. Maybe because of the many bicycles, if you've ever visited Amsterdam or Rotterdam, you have to beware where you walk, because before you know it, someone's ringing the bell and shouting at you and saying, please move aside, I'm here on my bicycle. You might know it of the waterworks. We are quite ingenious in that sense. We had to fight and combat the water for many, many decades and centuries which led to a certain cooperation within the Dutch culture, I think. And the facts and figures about the Netherlands, I think it's 17.213 million, so over 17 million people. We have a monarchy. This is our king and our queen. The capital, of course, is Amsterdam. We are located in the Eurozone. We co-founded the European Union, but also NATO, the OECD, the World Trade Organization. And we speak Dutch, but most of us can speak English as well. The GDP is the 17th absolute figure wide, uh, worldwide, $951 billion. And per capita, that results in $55,041 uh, per person. We're located in the Central European time zone, and we have summer and winter time. If you look at our region, this is the uh, region that we uh, cover, the Rotterdam, the Hague region. So we zoomed in a little bit on the Netherlands and now a bit more on our region. And our sectoral focuses within Innovation Quarter are nine focuses. You can ask, is that a focus? Yes, it is. Basically, the, our, our, our state, our region is the Netherlands in, in, in small, if you will. Maritime and port, large in Rotterdam. Horticulture, big, big greenhouse complexes. Aerospace, we have the European Space Agency within our region. Life Science and Health, they're working on COVID-19 uh, medicine, but also uh, vaccines at this moment. High tech is quite big in our region, digital technology, sustainable energy, circular economy, and of course, cyber security. And that is my focus. Not my, uh, my, not my expertise, if you will, but my sectoral focus. Our role within this whole ecosystem, we fund, we have money, we invest. Uh, so startups and scale-ups know to, how to find us and they are very happy to collaborate with us. We also organize collaboration, cooperation between innovative companies knowledge institutions and government. We call that innovation. And as Chris said, we assist foreign entities setting up their businesses and we help Dutch businesses to do business abroad. So if any of you is interested in the Netherlands, me and Chris and the whole team, we're more than happy to help you out. And uh, we do this all free of charge as we are governmentally funded. Hey, Security Delta, Rick is gonna talk about this afterwards. 
uh, I thought to include it anyhow. It's a Dutch national cybersecurity cluster. Uh, the core is at the HSD campus. It is the uh, National Innovation Center for Security in The Hague. The billions of turnover are growing every year, quite some jobs, quite some students in the field of security. And the aim is to enhance the security and stimulate economic growth. So their slogan is together we secure the future. And I think it's a very good one because only together we can combat the, uh, the, the criminals and everything that is happening online that we're not too happy about. It's coordinated by a foundation. Rick is one of the liaisons. He'll go into that a bit more. And the campus has about 50 tenants and the HSD Delta, the security Delta has about 280 plus members. The focal areas, cybersecurity, of course, the protection of critical infrastructure, which is a lot of cyber nowadays as well. Forensics, a lot of cyber nowadays as well. Urban security and national security. And the national security especially is a lot of cyber nowadays. The Hague, the backdrop of where we operate from, the International City of Peace and Justice, that's the official payoff, but I always add, and security. Now, why is this cluster organized in the Netherlands? I think if you look at the economy of the Netherlands, it's quite central, as I stated earlier. There's about 60 flights going up and down to London every day. Berlin, one and a half hour away, six and a half hours by train. Paris, three and a half hours by train. You, you, with a plane, you're, you're there in a heartbeat. So it's, 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 even though it's on the edges of Europe in a way, it's, it's quite centrally located between the major economies. Now, of course, the digital gateway to Europe, as we call ourselves, it's also very fascinating. If you look at the AMZIX, together with the NLX, the two biggest internet points in the world, uh, of combined, it is the biggest uh, internet exchange in the world, many data centers, over 200. I think we are the number one in broadband connections in the EU. We used to be in the world. I'm not sure who caught up with us, maybe Singapore. I'm not sure. We are a hub of intercontinental connections. Our airports are quite connected. Uh, many flights go in and out every day. Number three in the world for ICT infrastructure. Number one in the EU for outstanding use of ICT. I do not know what that means, but it sounds good to me. And 96% of our households have broadband connections. And that's pretty cool because everywhere in the Netherlands, of course, we have the benefit of being a small country. There is a good and decent internet. So the fiber optic networks are rolled out everywhere. Maybe it's because our soil is made out of clay. Maybe it's easy to dig in. I don't know, but it's working for us and we're happy with it. And this digital gateway to Europe provides you with the backdrop of the need of a lot of security, a lot of cybersecurity. We need to protect it. The most wired country in Europe, if you look at all the cables that come in through from the US on the, on the, on the ocean seabed, let's say, I think 12 out of 14 are coming into the Netherlands, hence the data centers. If you look at our talent, um, we're doing reasonably well. Uh, I think the OECD states us as one of the world's highest performing graduates. 90% of the population speaks conversational English and uh, a higher percentage, 96% speak it normally, let's say. Over 10,000 security students. There is a cybersecurity academy on the HSD campus. There's about 10 universities that offer specialized cybersecurity master programs. 15 universities of applied sciences that offer bachelor programs and courses. And we're really pushing it together with the HSD to go into the primary schools and the high schools, and even the vocational level as well. Innovation, this was interesting. As I was making this presentation, I came across a couple of things I wanted to share with you. I did not notice, but the microscope is a Dutch invention. As is the eye test. I can't read the lowest letters. I think I need glasses. But anyhow, the eye test supposedly is a Dutch invention as well. Cassette, CD, DVD, and Blu-ray, Philips, uh, one of Dutch proudest companies, if you will. They invented all these things. I knew this, uh, but it's, it's fascinating to see. Bluetooth, but also Wi-Fi. One of the inventors of Wi-Fi, his wife came up with the term Wi-Fi. It's, it's nice, you know. It's, it's something to be proud of, I think. The whole world is using it. Orange carrots. Carrots existed, but they used to be purple or white, and now they're orange because some Dutch farmer thought to cross-pollinate it with something else, and they came out orange. New to me. Stock exchange, and this one is very interesting, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. Uh, even back then in, in the 15, 1600s, uh, the Netherlands was a stable safe haven for money. 
where in Spain you couldn't really rest assured that your money wasn't being taken by the king. In the Netherlands, you could invest it. It attracted a lot of investments into the Netherlands and made our country big. Fair trade. It's not only about money, it's also about doing right. Fair trade uh, was invented by Dutch people who thought that was needed. Levies, man-made islands, our fight and, and struggle and love-hate relationship with the water has led us to be leading in that field. Um, I think the result is fairly unique. If you walk through Amsterdam or Leiden or Delft or Rotterdam, you see the canals, the Hague, it's so beautiful. And, and it all results in our ambiguous relationship that we have with the water because part of the Netherlands is situated below sea level, as you might know. The telescope from Leeuwenhoek, I think, was the guy who invented it. Uh, very interesting, and it's used in a lot of, in a lot of um, discoveries and journeys into outer space, of course. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's nice to have it on your resume as a Dutch nation, if you will. Now, a bit more concrete, competitive tax climate. Um, all companies have to pay taxes. And in the Netherlands, like next year, we're going to go down to 21.7% with the corporate tax rate. 15% uh, for the uh, first 200,000 euros. So quite competitive. What's also nice is we have an innovation box. So if you're a cybersecurity company, you do your R&D in the Netherlands, you can result in an effective uh, tax rate of 5%. Your R&D activities, they can be um, uh, subsidized by the government as well, uh, by tax incentives. And if you are an expat, if you live not in the Netherlands, but you, let's say you come from Taiwan, you set up in the Netherlands, for five years, you will have a favorable tax treatment. You will be eligible for a 30% tax ruling. And that means that your gross salary, the first 30% is not taxed. It's a bit, um, sometimes I'm a little bit jealous of my expat friends, but it's very good for them because of course you have to make a lot of costs if you're gonna change continents, if you're gonna live in a new area, in a new country. So the Dutch tax people were very pragmatic and they said 30% cut, five years, that's it. So it's very favorable. And also if you import goods, let's say you're a hardware security vendor and uh, you bring your goods into the harbor of Rotterdam, the VAT deferment upon import, you do not pay VAT upfront. So that can be very nice if your processes are a bit longer, and especially in these days with the coronavirus, it might be interesting to uh, look into payments and such as well. International business climate. I think 50% of our GDP is derived internationally. We are a trading nation. We have been for centuries and centuries. I think we have a little bit over 8,000 companies nowadays. I'm not sure how much it is at this point. This was a slide from one and a half year ago, I think. 160 international organizations like Eurojust, Europol, but also NATO is in The Hague, um, many, the International Criminal Court. We have strong ties with other international security regions and European institutions. 60% of all Forbes 2000 companies that are active in ICT, they have presence in the Netherlands, Microsoft, Google, Cisco, Tata, IBM, Oracle, Capgemini, Infosys, Sarafa, all of them. And if you look at all the companies in the Netherlands, let's say there's 100% of companies, only 1.2% have a foreign mother, a foreign parent company. But this 1.2% employs 19% of our labor force. So almost if you walk down the street here in The Hague, if I go out of the World Trade Center where we're situated now and I walk down the street and I count five people, one of these five people have a job because of international investments. And a lot of the R&D activities are created through that as well. It's, it's, it's very good for our economy. Now the cybersecurity market, uh, if you look at the annual loss, I was looking up the figures last night and, and I'm not sure which figure is correct, but I read about trillions due to some estimate. The ones that we found when we were doing uh, this research was 327 billion. In the Netherlands, it would result into about nine or 10 billion. It's quite a lot, and everybody in the industry knows this, of course. Um, but I think we should make the public and the people even more aware that cybercrime in this hyper-connected world, in a country like the Netherlands, which is very digitalized, is an absolute big, big, big problem, and we need to protect ourselves. The annual growth markets for IT, they say it's about 6.7%. Cybersecurity estimates were 145 
If you look at the data center, it's even a bigger estimation, 17 and a half. Now, to be honest, I'm not sure what it's going to be like post-COVID, but I've been talking to entrepreneurs since, since, since many years, but of course, also since March. And what we see is that some people are still doing very well in the consultancy and the training and, and, and those kind of companies are doing a bit less good with the COVID-19 crisis. But cybersecurity market in the Netherlands, I think there's about 66 and a half thousand uh, IT companies. Many are security related and about 2,500 companies they sell cybersecurity products or services. That includes, of course, resellers, amended security service providers, et cetera. But it's, it's, it's a reasonable size market. Uh, it's quite some revenue. Triple Helix, I think Rick will go into this as well. What we try to do is stimulate the collaboration of the government with the knowledge institutions and the businesses. It's not always easy, but if it works, the results are fabulous. And I think it's ingrained in a Dutch culture with the combating of the water and, and, and we had to stick together and collaborate. And we still do it. So I think what I see in my daily practice, I see a lot of governmental people knowing their way around the business area and the knowledge institutes that, that, that are entwined. If we do go on trade missions, we like to combine and for instance, the Technical University of Delft, they're usually uh, part of, of, of trade missions and such. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to, co to organize it, but it's really nice if it works. Legislation and quality of life. There's a strong governmental support for cybersecurity. Uh, that's important in the country. And I think it's growing every year. We were, for instance, the first country with a responsible disclosure policy. We're the third country in cyber readiness on the indexes. Um, second in the EU for the effective government policies. And we were one of the first national cybersecurity centers worldwide. A few fun facts. We are the sixth happiest country in the world, according to some research. I think the Nordics uh, beat us, and uh, I don't know why, because it's cold there, but what are you going to do? We have a good educational system. And a lot of bicycles, 1.3 per person. Cybersecurity industry numbers in our region, what we have estimated so far this year, I think is 6.7% of growth, 2.27 billion turnover, about 15,000 cybersecurity professionals, 400 businesses. So we're doing good, we're doing well. Of course, in The Hague, which is a governmental town, the uh, government of the Netherlands is not situated in Amsterdam in our capital, but in The Hague. And you see that there is a lot of purchasing power. If you look at the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Economic Affairs, Ministry of uh, Justice, uh, Secret Services, they're all in The Hague, NATO. So uh, yeah, a lot of power here. So it attracts companies, of course. And the challenges, if you look at the uh, image that the National Cybersecurity uh, Center has given in 2019, it is interesting. Vital processes, of course, they depend more and more on ICT, and there are less and less analog alternatives. If you look at our water systems, how are they protected? There used to be a small levee that would man be, be operated manually. Right now, it's all connected to the internet. It's a risk. Biggest threat right now are the state actors, according to the National Cybersecurity uh, Center. In Taiwan, you know what we are talking about, I think. A lot of geopolitical and economical reasons uh, for these state actors to um, go into our systems, uh, try to influence stuff. There's a low risk for attackers. Attribution is very difficult. So who did what and why? It's, it's hard to say. Uh, it's complex. It takes a lot of energy and time to find out the perpetrator and see who did what. Uh, the Netherlands is dependent on relatively a few solutions, let's say, and a few countries that provide them. Uh, I think I was talking to one of the guys from the Ministry of Defense. I think 85% of their products are um, bought by um, uh, from foreign vendors, let's say. And many sectors in the Netherlands, they just need to become more resilient. And that's our challenge for the coming years. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. It's also nice through Innovation Quarter, we uh, are in contact with many sectors. So we try to cross-pollinate and do cross-sectoral exchanges. Difficult sometimes, but very nice to do. And uh, yeah, with these challenges, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation. Chris, can I give it back to you? Chris, you're on mute. Chris, maybe.
Th thank you so much, Martijn, for uh, your concisive overview in the, in the presentation. And uh, what I really liked is that you not only showed the business opportunities and um, uh, facts like uh, tax uh, rates, etc., but also gave a insight in life in the Netherlands and our long history of innovation. So thank you so much. Uh, a, a good start also with uh, giving an overview of the cybersecurity landscape in the Netherlands. Now with the next speaker, we're going to um, focus uh, and um, tune in a bit more on one of the specific highlights and hotspots of cybersecurity in the Netherlands. We are going to hear more about the Hague Security Delta, um, which is a hotspot for cybersecurity located in and around the Hague, with a strong ecosystem covering all the aspects, all the aspects related to cybersecurity and security in general. And I'm going to give the floor to Rick Schiffelers, innovation liaison, who's going to tell you all about the details about the Hague Security Delta and its ecosystem. Rick, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you for the kind introduction and also to the speakers from yesterday's webinar. I think it was very interesting to hear the insights on uh, the Taiwanese market and opportunities. Um, and also thanks to, to Martijn, of course, for, uh, for giving us an insight in, in the Dutch security market. And I want to stress already before our presentation that we work closely together with Innovation Quarter and that cooperation is always very fruitful. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Rick Schifflers. I work indeed as Innovation Liaison at the Higgs Security Delta. And today I would like to speak on behalf of our organization actually about three uh, program points. So first of all, I think um, it's good to give you a bit of an overview of what HSD is. So it's, it's compiled of our organization, but also of a bigger, bigger ecosystem uh, and actually uh, a physical location. And then more specifically, our cybersecurity ecosystem. The second point I would like to, uh, to elaborate upon is the access to propositions to our partners, because I think that's most interesting for, uh, for our audience to hear. So what do you actually uh, get out of, uh, uh, well, becoming active in this, in this cluster uh, and by becoming a partner? And the third point is a bit more on what I uh, do on a day-to-day -day, uh, base which is uh, innovation programming. And I think that's also very interesting to see how our partners cooperate together to come uh, towards more innovative security solutions. And also a part of that is pre-competitive cooperation. So um, the Higgs Security Delta, we are a Dutch uh, security cluster and actually a network where uh, business, government, and knowledge institutions work together on innovative security. And then indeed, mainly in the fields of cybersecurity, but also, and it's always closely tied together, of course, in the fields of national, urban, and uh, uh, security and critical infrastructure, uh, but also forensics. Um, and what we uh, actually have, where I'm right now at this, at this moment, uh, there is a campus which is located in The Hague. We'll tell a bit more on that uh, after this, but our cluster is an open innovation ecosystem where then our partners um, share knowledge, and they actually uh, try to work towards more um, yeah, innovative security solutions, um, but that's only part of, 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 the, of the goal. And we'll go into what, what the other part is in a bit. Um, so our network consists out of 280 plus partners, um, both from uh, uh, government agencies. So you have to think about ministries, but also more operational um, um, well, divisions within uh, the Dutch government. Knowledge institutions, so we have uh, quite some of the big universities in this region uh, and nationally actually, uh, but also research institutions like TNO, uh, the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. Um, and then the other part, which is of course uh, really a big part of our uh, partner uh, ecosystem, are the businesses. And then you have to think about big multinationals, already mentioned by, uh, by Martijn, some of them. Uh, but also very local uh, and more uh, uh, compact as a MIS. Um, but what they all have in common, all these organizations, is that they uh, are convinced that by joining forces, they can make a contribution uh, to a more secure society. Um, so that's, that's a, bit of, uh, a bit about our ecosystem. 
So myself, I work for HSD Office, which is actually a foundation, and our main goal is to facilitate and accelerate cooperation within our cluster. Um, and we do this by providing our partners with uh, actually five propositions, and we call them the access to propositions. It's access to knowledge, to innovation, market, talent, and capital. Um, and why do we do that? We do that because we are convinced that these are all crucial elements to create a strong and efficient security market. So I'm going to touch upon all these uh, in my presentation, but I'm going to highlight the access to innovation part because that's what I predominantly work in. And I think it's also most interesting for you uh, in this presentation. So one more thing about the goal, because it's not only creating innovative security solutions, it's also about creating more business activity. And with that comes more jobs. Um, and we see that actually uh, as a way of reinforcing each other. And indeed, as mentioned by Martijn, uh, the slogan and the motto of our organization is also together we secure the future, both in a, a security sense, but also uh, on the economic part. So the HSD campus, um, it's located in The Hague. Uh, what we have here, we have our uh, foundation physically located, but at the same time, it provides great meeting rooms. Uh, organiz uh, organizations within our cluster are actually located here. And that creates a really lively atmosphere and also uh, a way of organizations to work together. And of course, now we have to be uh, in touch and stay in touch a bit more virtually during this COVID period. Uh, but normally it's, it's quite busy at this location where we have uh, a lot of uh, events like HSD cafes where knowledge is shared, but also where partners can, um, well, they, they can network and they can get in touch with each other. Um, so it's indeed based in The Hague, uh, as Martijn mentioned, uh, so I'm not going to elaborate on that now, but it's it's the hotspot for, for security organizations because it's so close to the government, because it's so close to Europol, to NATO. Uh, it's really where it happens in the Netherlands with regards to security. So a bit more about the access to propositions. Um, and I want to start off with talent because that's also something which is highly crucial for organizations to be uh, successful. Uh, what we do together with our partners, and I have to stress that everything we do is uh, is with, with our partners. Um, we execute a human capital agenda, and what we aim to do is we tackle discrepancies on the cybersecurity labor market. So you have to think about the fact that um, even though there is a lot of potential, there's a lot of talent, there's always room for more and better talent. And we have a couple of initiatives um, to facilitate that process. As Martijn also mentioned, there is a cybersecurity academy here uh, at this location. Uh, but in addition, I can also highlight two other elements. We have a dedicated website for students and professionals to really, um, well, to, to make transparent how this, this market functions and also how to make a career in this field. Uh, we organize matchmaking uh, events between students and organizations. And uh, our goal is to attract and develop more talent. And, and one of the uh, very concrete examples is the International Cybersecurity Summer School, uh, which I want to highlight as well. So this is an overview of the class of 2019 last year. Uh, this summer school has been organized five times already, and we do this in cooperation with Europol, with the NATO Communication and Information Agency, with Ernst & Young, EY, the University of Leiden, the Dutch, uh, factory, uh, the Dutch Innovation Factory Zoetermeer, and uh, last year also with the Higgs uh, with the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. And why I want to highlight this fact is because last year we had uh, 60 participants from 22 different uh, nationalities. And it's so interesting to, on the one hand, uh, get them on a higher level with regards to their expertise, because they're taught by the, the, the experts in the field from Europol, from NATO. But at the same time, it also provides a mechanism for organizations to scout talent uh, in, in this uh, student population. And as you can see, it was uh, uh, rewarded quite highly last year. Uh, this year, of course, uh, we have some issues with receiving foreign uh, uh, students, so we have to postpone to next year. But it's good to hear that the commitment for next year is also in from all the partners involved because they think it's such an important element, uh, talent. The other part, I'm just going to touch briefly upon it, but we have a, a website which you should definitely check out. It's completely focused on talent in uh, security, also in cybersecurity. What we do there is we provide insight in uh, 
uh, the domain, we write uh, analysis, we have news items, events, but, and most important maybe, we also post the jobs and internships from our partners. So I took a screenshot yesterday, you can see that there's at this point in time, uh, 193 jobs and internships, which are highly relevant to the students, but also as an organization to, to see or to post, okay, this is what I need. So we provide that platform. Uh, and also, of course, we provide it with background information on how you can form your career, which uh, education you can follow. Uh, you see there that there's 622 studies and courses actually in this field, um, which makes it uh, even more clear that this field is growing uh, and expanding. So another access to proposition is access to market, which is also, of course, interesting here. Um, together with our partners, often in uh, close cooperation with the Dutch Enterprise Agency and uh, Innovation Quarter, we uh, facilitate soft learning programs. We help um, uh, at least collaborate in the organization of trade missions and also partners for international business programs. And on the right, you see the program I was involved in myself. Uh, together with uh, the colleagues from uh, the Dutch Innovation Factory, sorry, with the Dutch Enterprise Agency, uh, but also many of our partners. And, and the goal of a program is, uh, of a PIB program, to position a consortium of uh, businesses substantiated with government uh, and knowledge institutions in an opportunity rich market abroad. So, um, in this specific instance, it was on blockchain solutions in Singapore. And what we see is that these type of programs where we can uh, help, well, establish them, our partners can together with, with, a, with a consortium, where also they have uh, the help of the government, uh, penetrate a market, which is highly interesting to them. Um, so that, that's something that we also uh, provide to our partners. And of course, we also have close connections with the Dutch Chamber of Commerce, and they give uh, free consultation to, to partners um, at this campus, but also virtually. Um, the connection to Taiwan is, of course, a, a very warm one, and I would like to stress that. Um, my colleagues uh, have been uh, together with, with, uh, with the Netherlands uh, office in Taipei, and also Innovation Quarter, uh, been organizing a delegation and roundtable uh, of ITRI, but also with, with uh, companies at HSD uh, during last year's one conference. And you see that picture on the left. Um, but we also received the Digital Minister Artery Tang at HSD campus, and even though I was not present myself, um, I heard it was a very fruitful meeting. Um, so it's good to see that uh, the connection between Taiwan uh, and the Netherlands is, is strong and growing, and it's also, at least from HSD, uh, HSD's point of view, um, facilitated under the global EPIC uh, umbrella, which is actually cooperation between the cybersecurity uh, networks throughout the world. Well, another part of what, of course, is important to our partners is uh, capital. So where can I find some uh, uh, finance? So we organize events for this where uh, investors can meet uh, and they can pitch our organizations. Uh, and we also have a finance guide, uh, which gives a quite a good overview of where different financial uh, uh, subsidies, for example, can be, uh, can be uh, got from. And there's a Dutch security tech fund, uh, which is also, um, I think, uh, quite an interesting way to, to, as an organization, see if you can grow by using uh, and utilizing the instruments that we have to offer. And myself, I'm not the, the expert on capital or on finance, but we have people within our team who actually do give consultation on that, um, which is interesting, I think. Another part, and I'm gonna uh, rush through it a bit because I want to get through the innovation part, which really excites me, is um, access to knowledge. What we also organize is uh, meetings, so the cafes I talked about, where our partners can collaborate, they can present on different topics, and we compile reports ourselves or together with our partners on topics of interest. And you have to think about AI, about data diodes, or about quantum computing. Um, so in that sense, it's a, it's a really trusted environment for innovation, but also for knowledge sharing, um, where all the partners uh, usually uh, uh, have, have the, the, the motivation to, to make this field uh, better by not just operating within their own silo, but by reaching out. 
So access to innovation, um, what does that actually entail? So we have a whole method for innovation, but I'm not going to bore it uh, going to bore you with it now because I think it's it's a very useful theoretical way of uh, building consortia. Um, but of course, you will have the slides afterwards. You can go through it. Just want to highlight that what we do is we always try to make sure that in all the innovation programming we do, there's businesses, government, and knowledge institutions involved. Um, that's just what what Martijn mentioned the triple helix. It's embedded in our in our Dutch uh, DNA. And it also is necessary to tackle some of the most difficult security questions uh, out there. So not going too much into detail of how we facilitate the processes. I think it's more interesting to, to see that we actually have quite some projects and uh, programs running. And I just took a print screen of our website, uh, which you can look up yourself, of course, but it gives an overview of all the topics our partners and are facilitated by our foundation are working upon. Um, and these are really topics that are either new or there are uh, very uh, hot topics, which means that um, you know you're always working on 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 something which is relevant. I think. So this is maybe still a bit an oversight, but what I can do is I can give you an example of a project I'm involved in myself because it gives you an idea of how that then actually works. So one of our partners is the Ministry of Defense, and then also an innovation part of that. It's called Front. Uh, and what they did is they reached out to us and they, they mentioned that um, they are exploring uh, the creation of a di data diode based on open source. And to give you a very brief oversight of what a data diode is, it is a device, a physical device, where data, data sorry, <laughs> can only flow in one direction, and it's physically impossible for it to flow in a different direction or in the other direction, which makes it inherently uh, a security device. And we have, I need to stress this, we have partners in our ecosystem who provide great and high grade uh, uh, solutions and data diodes. Um, so they already exist. But what the Ministry of Defense said is, okay, we see also the opportunity for these devices to be used in different domains, uh, maybe uh, also based on an open source variant making them more available to, well, other applications which are not, uh, where they're not being used now. So the Ministry of Defense came to us, they asked us, can you put together uh, a pre-competitive market consultation on this? Uh, so that's what we did. As an organization, we put uh, many of our partners active in this field together in a round table session. So it was business, but it was also government and knowledge institutions. And we basically discussed like, can this uh, work? Uh, is this possible? And the answer was yes, so that was good. What we did then is we organized some knowledge, um, well, elements in this. We organized uh, an event, but also a report. And then actually the, the Ministry of Defense, and we, we facilitated the, the process, um, came up with a demand articulation. Okay, what do we actually need? And uh, how are, are we gonna put this in the market? This was put in the market and uh, a number of our partners then uh, actually applied to get this uh, to get this this work or this job and uh, in the end the ministry of defense chose one of these organizations to build a demonstrator well i'm, I'm going to skip through the whole process of the building of the demonstrator which was done by our uh, partner but uh, it's very good news that the demonstrator is uh, is done now it's it's out there and it's also being uh, and has been tested already by some organizations and it looks very positive and what we are going to do now and this is also something that has to be done uh, by the ministry of defense of course uh, but together with us seeing okay how can we create an, an ecosystem also an open source ecosystem where this can actually then go to market and maybe in a later stage even go international but that's that's something that lies behind the horizon um, and I, I once again would like to stress that we always want to do this together with all our partners because that's what we work for as an office. So I think these are some of the elements that um, make this cluster functioning and also uh, efficient. Um, and I think the, the access to proposition give an overview of, okay, this is what organizations need to succeed and especially businesses need all these access to propositions. Here are some other elements. I think this is the start of, of uh, the Higgs security delta, which are essential for cluster development. 
and I think you see uh, a couple of the of the points I mentioned in here. Um, but in the end, I, I need to stress that this ecosystem only works because of the the great and uh, great amount, but also the, the the high expertise of all the partners involved. And that's also what I want to communicate to you. So if you're interested in expanding to the Netherlands, of course you need to get in contact with Innovation Quarter, but you also need to uh, come to us and to have a talk with us and to see, okay, how can this, this ecosystem work for me? Um, and in that sense, I would like to invite you also to, to become a partner. Um, I think it's really interesting and you can already see a lot on our website of what, what that entails, but to get involved in this, uh, in this cluster and uh, not only make a contribution to a more secure society, but also help your business grow. So having said that, um, I want to thank you for your attention. Of course, I'm open for all feedback questions and suggestions. Um, so I'll give back to your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Rick, for your um, complete story about the Hague Security Delta and the H ecosystem. Um, also great to hear your information about the, the, the different accesses, uh, uh, access to talent, to, to uh, capital, um, to market, etc. So thank you, very, uh, very, very helpful, I think, for the participants. Um, there's now, uh, we now go into the um, Q&A session. Um, I have the chat uh, function open here. Uh, quite some questions came in already, so let me start with the first question which came from uh, Lisa Wang. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, Lisa Wang. Um, she asks, is there, are there resources, for example, cheaper rent of office or link, a link to local enterprises for cybersecurity startups in Taiwan who like to explore the Netherlands and the European the EU market? Uh, maybe, Martijn, you can answer this. Uh, I, I think automatically about the soft lending program or maybe the EPIC, but maybe there's more possibilities. Can you answer Lisa, please? Martijn. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for this uh, question. A nice presentation, Rick. Uh, it's always good to see how, uh, how many programs you guys are doing. It's quite impressive. If you look at the uh, resources, I don't think we have very many programs where we actually stimulate uh, companies by flying them in, by paying for their air tickets or whatever. We'd like companies to come at their own strength, if you will. And we have designed a program for anybody that is interested in the Dutch market that indeed, as Chris mentioned, we call soft landing. So a company comes in, we set up a nice um, um, agenda for them, a schedule. And we will show you around during the days that you are here, and you can stay up to 90 days even. I'm not going to show you around for 90 days, that's a bit much, but uh, we will help you find your way in the ecosystem. And I think that's way more valuable than any 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 euro grant. Uh, office prices uh, are sometimes a little bit negotiable. You have to talk to Rick and his buddies about that. <laughs> but I think it's not about the money in that sense. I think it's about we try to make you feel at home. We do your homework together. Before you arrive, we will look into what you need. We will set up the meetings for you and we will guide you in all your steps that you would need to take to enter the Dutch market and the European market. So there's definitely a package, but it isn't as as plain or as flat, or I don't know how you call it in English, but it's as, as sort of as just cheap rent or something. We, we'd like to take it a bit more to the next level and really help the companies find their way and what we've seen in the past is that, that uh, soft landing has helped quite a few companies to really, really, really get their foot on the ground in a solid way and not waste much time or resources or personnel or flying up and down 20,000 times in order to catch that first client. Because if you arrive at Schiphol Airport with all these many connections just with a suitcase and you have to find your way, I can give you a free office, but what's that going to do for you? By the way, if you soft land, you are able to use our premises for up to 90 days free of charge. So that is free, but it's only for 90 days. I hope that answers the questions a bit. Yes. What do you think? Yes, Martijn. Thank you. Rick, you want to add something? or? Yes, yes. No, indeed, as mentioned by Martijn, I think, uh, um, of course, and I mentioned it as well, here at the campus, we also have uh, office space, uh, which is, uh, you know, you can rent that. But at the same time, uh, also for startups or for uh, sometimes even people who are just uh, with one or two uh, persons in their organization, uh, they can uh, ask for a uh, flexible working environment. 
which means that you can make use of the campus, of the, uh, uh, well, actually the, the facilities offered here. Um, and you can, once again, uh, involve yourself with, with uh, all the other organizations present here. And I think, indeed, it's not only about the, the price of renting, it's, it's more about what do you get back when you yeah. in, engulf yourself in an ecosystem. And once again, to stress, I think the cooperation with IQ is always uh, very good. Martijn comes by with, with organizations interested in, in expanding, and then uh, we explain uh, both from IQ, but also from HSD, what, what we can provide. And I think that, that's priceless, as, uh, as you could say. Yeah. Great. One Chris, one last addition, if I may. We have people on the ground in Taiwan. Uh, I didn't really clearly mention it in my presentation. I should have. But we have the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency. It's the mother organization of all the regions in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, they have Dennis Bierman, uh, Alex Chen, and um, Ian. I think there's also an Ian Chen. Ian, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Ian, yeah. So we have three people on the ground that can definitely also help you out. They also help you out free of charge into getting to know all the details that you would need to be successful in the Dutch market. So the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, remember that, guys. Yeah. That's very interesting. The, yeah. They, are, they work from uh, the um, Netherlands Taipei office in uh, Taipei, indeed. Uh, great addition, uh, Martijn. Then we go to the next question, also from Lisa Wang. Um, and this is a question I think we are all asking ourselves. Does the Cybersecurity Week in the Netherlands will be held at the end of the year? Not, not, in, yeah, not in the way that we used to have it. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 has spoiled our parties. It was very nice in the previous years. We had uh, very interesting uh, speakers. It was very international. People from all over the world were able to speak and share their ideas and their knowledge. And, and in the evening, we also had some great parties. This year, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. There's going to be one conference in the last two days of September, but it will be digital. Not sure what to expect. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it's 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 a bit too challenging with all the measures and the flying mm -hmm. and stimulated, etc. So not well, let's really hope for, really used to me. Let's hope for 2021 then. Yeah, that would be awesome, and we'd love to have a big Taiwanese uh, delegation trade mission. That would be very very nice. Thanks. Next, uh, we go to the next question, also from uh, Lisa Wang. Can you elaborate on the need for cyber in the uh, can you elaborate on the need for cybersecurity solutions in the Netherlands, such as IoT protection or financial security? Rick, maybe for you, this one. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, what, what we see or what I see is that uh, we often are in contact with organizations like National Defense or the public prosecutor who actually have, have a, a question or a demand. And maybe it's uh, good to highlight, for example, that uh, we also have a project uh, which is uh, based on uh, how to prevent or to provide intervention for CEO fraud. So actually, how do you provide, well, actually obstacles for that to take place? And, and once again there, I think what is so strong is that uh, together with uh, the public prosecution uh, offices, office, uh, they, they work together with knowledge institutions, but also with <laughs> solutions in that sense. Um, the other thing I, I talked about, for example, is that uh, the data diode can provide a solution also for IoT devices. So maybe instead of giving you a complete list of uh, solutions in need, I think it's to stress that always what we do here is that we see where is the demand from the question or, or the question from organizations, and then how can we build a consortium around that, which actually delivers something uh, interesting. Maybe for example, uh, which was a program that was initiated a couple of years ago with the Ministry of Justice and uh, Security, was about, was on uh, satellite observations, and and they saw and they uh, they understood that satellites can also be used to um, well to actually see more than uh, they are used for. So, for example, you can see drought movements, you can see bushfires, you can see whether drug waste has been um, well, well, deployed somewhere more or less. So these are just examples of, of the innovation programming uh, we do. And I think if you have a look at our website, there's an expansive list of organizations and also topics uh, for which solutions are uh, necessitated. 
Yeah, and if I may add to that, real simply put, I think the IT security is a bit more advanced worldwide, also in the Netherlands, and I think the banks are, are, are the front runners in the digital security. And I think the IoT is really catching up. So I think there's more demand, if you ask me, for IoT protection than financial security protection uh, in the sense that they're a bit more advanced. But they both need uh, good vendors and good solutions, and the banks are willing to pay for it at this point, but IoT is catching up in OT. Yeah. Okay. Next question. There's still a couple. So that's, that, that's good. That means there's... Um... There's certainly interest in this theme. Um, does HSD and or IQ also fund foreign startups like those from Taiwan? Um, Martijn, you want to say something or shall I answer this one? Yeah, you can answer it as well, Chris, if you want. Yeah, like, um, well, like you saw in the presentation, uh, both Innovation Quarter and HSD work together on uh, specific startup funds. Uh, we have our own start a fund which is called unique and then there's also the uh, security uh, the dot security fund uh, rick uh, mentioned um we do so we do um invest in startups but foreign startups is a bit more tricky because we only invest in companies that have their main entity in the netherlands uh, and especially from our own funds in in the region so yes, it would, in theory, it would be possible, but it's really important that you have your legal entity in the Netherlands, um, and then still you have to apply for an investment like any of the other companies. So it's not like an incentive, uh, but it is, in theory, it's possible, but we are quite strict on how your legal entity is structured and also where the IP rights are um, housed. So if the IP rights are not in your entity in the Netherlands, it will be difficult slash impossible to get a funding from us so uh yes but under very strict conditions that that's basically the summary of my answer and the market chris is able to uh finance it if you look at the dutch innovation uh tech fund they for instance they allocated a uh, part of their resources into finding international companies so those would definitely be Taiwanese. yeah yeah so with from other yeah there's other funding of course but um and True. also private funding that could be an option too and we do help companies to find other sources of uh, uh, financial support or, or investments but um, yeah that, that, that's something else than our own funds but yes there's of course also uh, ways to find other uh, other capital rick is that uh, is that complete yeah that's a complete uh, overview i think perfect then we go to the next uh, question still some more some some more to go um yeah there's a question here can you tell us a bit more about the cyber security week and one conference in the netherlands and how companies from taiwan can participate well uh, martijn already gave an answer on uh, what's happening this year so there will be a, two digital days um about the one conference i suppose martijn that the digital conference is uh, um, accessible also for foreign companies right yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. Uh, it's organized by the Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Ministry of Justice. So I'm not really up to speed on how they're going to um, how they're going to shape it. Let's say, but yeah. if it's going to be digital, it's going to be open to the whole world. Yeah, uh, I think about this. If there's more about it, we'll certainly communicate about it uh, broadly. So uh, via LinkedIn, via our websites, etc. So please keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm sure there will be. Uh, a call to participate uh, in the coming months uh, and of course hopefully you can participate next year uh, with a real delegation uh, in the fall of 2021 but well, of course this also depends on all the COVID-19 developments and um, then another question can you introduce some of the unique Dutch cybersecurity solutions or projects in the Netherlands Rick I think I'm sure you can mention some of the duels you have uh, within HSD or outside of HSD that are uh, Dutch and are um, I, are impressive. Sorry, Durals? Can you introduce some of the unique Dutch cybersecurity solutions or projects in the Netherlands? Yeah, yeah, I think that ties a bit into uh, uh, what I explained earlier about the innovation programming, but I do need to stress that we have uh, interesting um, uh, 
uh, organizations that also grow within our cluster and without mentioning uh, specific solutions. Um, maybe I, I mentioned one specific organization, it's called CyberSprint, which has uh, started here at the campus and it has grown uh, as an organization actually to such a big extent that they now are located in a different uh, location uh, and they have customers within, uh, within, within the Dutch government. Uh, but, but in that sense, I think, um, yeah, that, that's quite a good example of, of how this ecosystem can work uh, for partners without going too much into detail on uh, specific solutions. Yeah, and also you see a lot of threat intel and, and, and uh, those kind of companies are doing quite well. Also, the IoT protection, if you look at uh, Security Matters, got acquired by Forest Scout for $113 million. Fox IT, that used to be the biggest vendor in the Netherlands, they got acquired by uh, NCC, a big British corporation. We had uh, many, many acquisitions locally. Uh, so the field is quite active and, and, and the pearls, the crown jewels, if you will, they're being uh, picked up by the market at uh, rapid speed. So you see it's a, it's a thriving ecosystem. Sometimes if we send some emails to some of our old friends that say they bounce and they come back with, oh, we changed our name, we got acquired, you know, if you haven't heard of it. It's, it's yeah, there, there's a lot going on and the Dutch are playing their role in the, in the system, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Martijn. There's another question. This one is from Becky Wang. Um, Rick, I think this one is one for you. What is your view on the Erasmus Joint Masters Program, uh, SECLO, S-E-C-C-L-O, Security and Cloud Computing, and EIT Digital School of Cybersecurity Program? Um, are you familiar with this Joint Masters Program, Rick? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with this specific master program. Of course, we do have uh, connections to EIT Digital. Also, last year, they were involved uh, in the summer school where they provide a coach, also on entrepreneurship and cybersecurity. On this specific MOSS program, I am not aware that, uh, or on the specifics, but once again, please check out www.securitytalent.nl because we list there most of the programs. Yeah. Well, well, thanks a lot then to Becky Wang. Then we also learned something on our site uh, during the webinar. So, great, we'll check it out. And thanks for the question. And then I have in the chat box one final question. Um, are there any limited issues for business travel after COVID-19? And maybe this is one I should answer because I'm also managing the uh, Corona COVID-19 crisis team in our own organization. Um, yeah, this is a difficult question. We, of course, don't know what's going to happen after COVID-19. Uh, what we notice at the moment is that the business, business travel and, and travel um, limitations at the moment are being opened a little bit, so we can more and more uh, access uh, get access to to, to uh, uh, other countries. Um, we're now allowed to go on holidays uh, within uh, Europe. Um, uh, flights uh, are picking up. Airlines are uh, opening more more lines. So um, yeah, travel is is opening up a bit. Um, Hopefully this will proceed in the coming months. Of course, it's it's difficult to predict what will happen next year, but I expect uh, that there won't be any limitations after COVID-19. The question is, when do we talk about post uh, post COVID? That that is a bit uh, unpredictable. So hopefully uh, things will normalize um, uh, rather soon. Um, the only thing I can say is it's opening up at the moment at uh, at a steady pace. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat uh, function coming by. Um, the last question Chris, about uh, the limited Chris. business travel was from Aqua Shoe. So, oh, Martijn? Can I ask a question to the audience? I cannot see who's in the audience, but maybe uh, people can reply via chat. Is there any company that would be interested in participating in a soft landing that we should be talking to in the coming weeks? Good question, and I, I would ask the participants to either answer uh, in the chat function or maybe if you want to react uh, directly to uh, Martijn, um, it can also be done by email. Uh, but feel free to uh, add it in the, in the chat function, um, it's, that, that's up to you. But uh, yeah, of course, this is an open invitation to any of the participants to uh, 
uh, to join. I think Martijn is now adding his uh, email address to the in the chat function. Great. Um, then I want to open for another couple of minutes um, the microphone for people who have additional questions and want to ask something. So for the participants, are there any remaining questions that you want to ask either via the chat or directly uh, via your microphone? Feel free to uh, do so. Well, I think, well, we had quite a number of questions, so I think that all the questions are answered. Um, Rick and Martijn, uh, are you, will, you present, will your presentations will be shared afterwards with the participants? Because I suppose we have the contact details. Yep. Yes. Yes. Great. So then uh, to finalize this webinar, um, yeah, I can confirm that your presentations will be sent to you via your contact details, which you left on the uh, 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 on the application uh, site. Um, if you have any additional questions which you want to ask directly to Martijn or to Rick, uh, or maybe based on the presentation you get sent to, uh, feel free to contact uh, Rick, Martijn, or myself. For now, I all want to thank you very much for your time and your uh, attention. Um, and a special thanks also for the speakers, uh, Martijn and Rick, for sharing your thoughts and your uh, information. Um, I wish everyone all the best uh, in health, but also in business in the coming period. And hopefully we can see each other in not too far a future, either in Taiwan or in the Netherlands. Uh, have a really good uh, either day or uh, uh, evening. And um, thank you for now. Goodbye. Bye-bye.